So, uh, so thanks for organizing the colloquium. Um, uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, in this talk, I'm going to um, present a way to think quantitatively through the consequences of reducing transportation costs between any two places in the US, okay? and what that means for uh, trade flows among any two places in the US, but also what that means for uh, wages and employment and land values and uh, you know, all the other local outcomes that one may be interested in. Um, uh, but before I do that, let me uh, motivate a little bit my approach and let me introduce a couple of key concepts I will, come, I will keep coming back uh, while, I, uh, while I talk. So um, the economic activity in modern economies relies crucially on uh, movement, on movements of goods, of course, primary inputs, capital goods, pharmaceuticals, meat, uh, but also on movement of people. People uh, choose where to live, but they choose to work in another place. They choose to consume in other places. They migrate, they change where they live, right? And so uh, the transportation network is, uh, is really at the core of, of the economy and it determines many things. It determines how much, of the, uh, 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 how much of the production of US takes place in Chicago versus New York versus DC, how much of the production of a particular good takes place in a single place and then uh, it's shipped out rather than being dispersed over the territory. But it also determines how much of what happens in a particular place spills over as a consequence on other local outcomes in other places, right? And uh, I'll refer to these linkages, broadly speaking, as uh, spatial linkages. So, uh, um, so I will argue that um, if we want to um, uh, uh, predict, if we want to understand the consequences of changes in the network itself, we are going to need uh, a way to incorporate the existence of these spatial linkages, both movements of goods and people, uh, in, in our analysis, okay? And so I will first show you uh, very briefly uh, some, uh, uh, some measures of these spatial linkages uh, for, for my, you know, the, the ones that are relevant for my purposes. Uh, and then I will introduce a, a model, I will describe a model. This is going to be a, a county level model of US. So the geographic unit of aggregation is going to be uh, counties. And uh, uh, this model is going to incorporate these uh, spatial linkages, and it's going to be a quantitative model in the sense that if you provide me with engineering estimates of how much transportation costs are declining from any place to any other place, the model will tell you how much trade flows will change from any place to any other place, but also how much wages and employment and, and uh, real income will change okay, across the territory. And then, uh, after I've described the model, I will, uh, I will use it. Uh, I will reduce transportation costs between two cities in the US. And uh, uh, this is going to be a fairly stylized example uh, uh, with no pretense, really, or of, of really generality. But, but uh, the, the messages are going to be very uh, uh, simple to understand, OK? So uh, if there are no questions, let me, let, me, uh, uh, let me introduce the first uh, side of it, which is the extent of spatial linkages of uh, coming from trading goods. And this, uh, you guys uh, know a thing or two about it. You probably know more than I do. Uh, so a simple way of understanding uh, how much spatial linkages matters for trading goods is to take a US state, uh, take all the expenditure on tradable goods, right, uh, by firms and, and consumers, and ask how much of that expenditure falls on stuff that is produced out of state. Right? And if that number is very high, then, uh, then, then the spatial linkages are very strong. And if that number is very low, then they're not so important. Right? So here are some high trade uh, uh, states, and here are some low trade states. And things are kind of intuitive. Uh, the high trade ones are DC, New Hampshire, Maryland, uh, Delaware. Uh, so in these states, most of what's consumed is coming from somewhere else. So here, uh, uh, trade linkages are kind of very important. And there are some states which, have, which are low trade, like Texas, California, for example. These states are states where a lot of stuff is produced. And so the share of expenditure that falls outside is kind of small. Right? So there's a couple of things I want to say about this. This is called low trade group, but this is not really low number. If you ask what's the same number for US, that is, what's the share of US expenditure that falls on goods that are produced uh, out of US, that number is in the single digits. It's like here. Right? So, um, so that's low trade, but that's not really a low number. And uh, uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that, uh, there's, that there's a lot of variability in these spatial linkages. And the picture is kind of even more nuanced than this. 
uh, because if a critical input in production is really completely imported from out of state, from out of state, then trade linkages matter even if you are here, right? And it happens, I didn't know about coals, but it happens that Michigan imports the totality of the coal it consumes, right? So, so spatial linkages in goods are, are, are important and I'm sure this is no news to you. Uh, there's another piece of the spatial linkages which are also part of our daily experience, but maybe we don't appreciate uh, the consequences of it too much. Let me take a question first though, yes. Uh, just a simple question. Yeah. The, the examples you gave yeah. could be simply due to the fact that small states have to take things from other places and big states, things are done internally. Totally, totally, totally. I, in fact, in, fact the, in that case, there's going to be a, a very important example of spatial linkages that, that are uh, present throughout the territory. And so in that case, the transportation network really has a central role in the sense that if you disrupt trade in that case, the whole economy is going to collapse. But, but I, I, again, I'm not sure why that's important because the goods could be traveling the same distance. It's just they're crossing two state lines from, from New Jersey to Maryland and they're crossing no state lines from Dallas to Houston. So what, I, I, what does that I, I, mean I for understand. the network? So, so, so states are a geographic unit of analysis that, at which the data is produced. Uh, you, can, uh, you can produce pictures like this for trade among cities, for trade among counties. And, uh, and what I want you to take from, from this picture is only that special linkages in goods are extremely important, are more important uh, uh, within US than they are outside. Okay, so that's the only thing I wanna say. And then I agree that if you make the whole state, the whole US one state, then you're gonna measure no special linkages, but that's a bad measure of special linkages, right? So that's, that's the only thing I wanna say. Um, so there's an, uh, another question, yes. So, <coughs> did you say imports? This is Gerard McCullough. So imports as a percent, import ex expenditures as a percent of GDP on imports are 2%? No, 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 uh, not okay. GDP, of total output. Total output, not, not the income produced, but the total revenues of every US, okay? More questions? Because that's a comparable measure to what I have here. This is total expenditure, right? Uh, okay, so, um, so there's another piece uh, of special linkages, which is kind of uh, part of our daily experience, um, uh, which is commuting. So uh, let me show you my two points with two maps. Uh, so this is a map of the DC area. This, is, this map is asking how, uh, so where do Arlington's residents work? So Arlington is here, and uh, it happens that 31% of residents in Arlington work in Arlington, but 34 of them work in DC. And, uh, and uh, other big pieces are outside the area. And so all in all, 70% of people that um, live in Arlington work somewhere else, right? So why is this important? Well, because if uh, labor demand uh, increases in Arlington, if something good happens there and labor demand increases, there's a very easy way to increase employment in Arlington because you just need to convince people to take a shorter commute, right? And so in that case, uh, employment is gonna grow a lot and wages are gonna change just a little bit, right? On the other hand, if that 70% number was a, was a much smaller number, what would happen is that in response to the same change in labor demand, would happen that wages would grow a lot and employment would change just a little bit because then to increase employment, you need to convince people either to take longer commutes or to migrate closer to the area, right? And so, um, so, so the first piece, the first message here is how much a county is integrating in the commuting network, network really matters for the response of, local, of the local economy to changes in, in, in local labor demand. And that's gonna matter for us because changes in transportation costs will also change, will also imply changes in labor demand. Okay, so that's the first piece I wanted to say. And the second piece I wanted to say, I wanted to point out is how far these spatial linkages extend. And let me make that point with another map. So this is a map of where uh, DC workers live, okay? So uh, this is saying 30% uh, of the people that work here in DC, they actually live here. Uh, but 12% but of them come from Fairfax County, 16% of them come, uh, sorry, 14, come from Montgomery County. Uh, so so uh, this is kind of intuitive. The question here is, if uh, labor demand increases out here, is this gonna impact labor supply to DC or not, right? And these are fairly small numbers, so you may think that this is not gonna be a big deal, but the thing is there's people in the middle who are big contributors to DC who can choose whether to work there or work outside. And so if labor demand increases here, this is gonna draw away some labor supply from DC because there's a bunch of people here that are choosing, 
right? So, so this is to say that spatial linkages in labor markets extend far beyond what we would initially think. That is to say, they extend beyond what we would think it's a normal commuting distance, okay? So these are the two messages I wanted to, 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 uh, to convey here. Uh, spatial linkages in goods and in people are, 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 are very uh, important. Uh, so let me describe a model now that incorporates these two sides. And uh, uh, so here I'm gonna just describe a model. There's a formal model uh, in a paper uh, in a paper that is, that is mentioned in this slide that's joint work uh, with Steve Redding and Stefan Rossi Hasberg in Princeton. Uh, and I'll mention some extensions later as we go along. Um, so this model is, uh, is, is, is fairly stylized in some dimensions, and in fact, it's really a general purpose model. It's not exactly a rail industry model. Uh, uh, but but the, the, the model here has people and has firms, and people here have two roles. They spend, they act as consumers, and as consumers, they spend their money on land or housing. I'm gonna use these terms interchangeably. And they spend money on goods. Okay, and, uh, and when they spend money on goods, these goods can be produced anywhere. They are shipped from where they are produced to their county of residence. And so the price the consumers will pay will incorporate local conditions where the goods are produced and the transportation costs. Okay? Uh, people as, consume, as, as workers, uh, they choose where to live and they choose where to work, okay? looking at the overall economy. So they look at the cost of living in one place and the job they can find nearby. Okay, and so the transportation infrastructure for commuters will matter for the distribution of commuting patterns across US, pretty much in the same way as the transportation infrastructure for merchandise will matter for the distribution of prices that consumers pay. Okay? Um, firms are uh, very stylized here. Uh, you, uh, you have a firm, you have your product, you choose where to locate, where to produce, you're gonna pick a county, and then you're gonna sell it anywhere in US. And if you sell it in your own county, no transportation costs. If you sell it outside, you're going to pay transportation costs. And so the CIF price will depend on your local conditions and on the, on the, on the, on the shipping costs. Uh, so what is it that determines the local prices for firms? Uh, well, uh, it's going to be labor. So firms in this world only use labor to produce. And so uh, the wages that they pay where they are active are going to determine their unit cost. Right? And now this is the wage of people that commute to the county, not the wage of people that live in the county necessarily. And then the second thing that matters is the productivity of a county. Okay? And you can think of it as something like the quality of business environment or the local tax structures or how efficient the courthouse there is. You know, all these things. We're going to take them as given. In fact, we're going to measure them. We're going uh, we're, we're to have nothing to really say about what determines that productivity. Okay? And so these two things will determine the unit cost, and then that unit cost at the origin will be compounded with the transportation cost to determine the price at the end. And, and uh, uh, again, if you, if you don't like some of these assumptions, they can be uh, really generalized. Uh, but, but here you'll see the uh, necessary elements that I want you to take away uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from this conversation. Um, OK, so, so I described you. The, the, the structure of the model, let me uh, spend some time talking about two key economic forces uh, that, that will drive all the results. Okay? The first one is uh, spatial linkages in trade, okay, in trading goods. So this is not showing well. Uh, so this, this is supposed to be a, 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 a subscript. Uh, and it was a subscript in my, on my screen. But anyway, let me, let me so, so what are the revenues of, uh, of, a, of a firms in, a, in an origin, okay? What are the revenues uh, for firms in Cook County, Illinois? Well, the revenues are the sum across all destinations, okay, of how much, how much, people, uh, uh, how much people spend there on consumption goods, the total expenditure on, on, on goods of New Yorkers, times what? Times the market share that uh, Cook County has in Manhattan, right? And that's summed across all the destinations. So the revenues of those firms are going to be uh, the, the, the expenditure of New Yorkers times the market share that it, Cook County has in Manhattan, plus the expenditure of people that live in DC times that market share, plus the expenditure that lives in any other place times that market share, right? And so the, what determines this market share is really where most of the action is going to be, OK? For example, if wages in Cook County go down or productivity in Cook County goes up, that makes the FOB price lower, 
and that makes the market share of Cook County anywhere higher, right? Or if transportation costs from Cook County to uh, Manhattan go down, uh, then this is going to decrease the CIF price for stuff that is produced in Chicago and, and sold in New York. And this is going to increase the market share of Cook County, and it's going to decrease the market share of everybody else who's selling there. Right? And in fact, this for our purposes, this is, where, this is going to be where the, where, the, where the rubber hits the road, or, or really where the, this is not an appropriate metaphor here, this uh, is where the, where the wheel hits the rail, right? And, and, and because, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce transportation costs between two places, okay? And that'll change the market share. And then from there, that'll change the labor demand in the origin, and that'll change the employment and wages and real income and everything else. Okay, so that's going to be where we start. Um, that's going to be where we start. And so, the, and the last thing that determines this market share, I'll tell you after the question. So I Can keep I you in suspense. Clarifying question. You yes, say yes, yes. transportation costs to zero to D. Do you mean transportation prices or transportation costs? We're worrying about things like sunk costs and common no, costs. No, 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 no. Exactly. So this is one. This is this is a very good question. This is uh, one piece where where the model is making a simplifying assumption. So the the, the way that makes these these whole classes of model tractable is uh, is is the fact that we uh, typically assume what's called iceberg transportation costs. That is to say. To, to, uh, to send one unit of your good uh, at destination, you have to send really 1.2 units away from you, okay? And they melt along the way. So that's a, that's a proportionality assumption on the costs, which may not be uh, uh, correct in, in some dimensions. But if you make that assumption, that's going to give us a long mileage to, to, to talk about all the other consequences. If you wanted to incorporate that quantitatively, it's still feasible the equations don't come out as nicely. So, so the quantitative part can still be done because it's the computer that is doing all the work, but the equations don't come out as nice. So the intuition is a little harder to convey. Okay. Uh, okay. So the last thing I wanted to say is the last thing that determines the market share is, is how tough the competition is from firms anywhere in the US for New Yorkers' wallets. Okay. And that's going to be in the denominator of the market share, right? If the transportation costs, if the transportation network is such that it's very easy to ship things into New York, competition for New York, for the New York market is gonna be very strong, right? And that is gonna push down the market share for any single firm, okay? So that is the, the last piece of what determines the market share. Um, uh, so that's about uh, trading goods, and there's a, there's a feature of the data which is really stark, which you probably are aware about, uh, which is the relation between trade flows and distance. Okay, so this is a measure of distance. Uh, let me now talk about how we build it. Uh, and, uh, and what this relation is saying is that basically a 1% increase in distance decreases trade, vo trade values between two places by 1.3% in this case, okay? And that's a fairly stable relation. The slope may change a little bit depending on the application, and it varies certainly by sector, okay? But this is a stark feature of the data, and that's gonna play a role, in fact, in our results. So the second force I wanted to mention is, uh, is commuting linkages, okay? Uh, spatial linkages in the labor markets. And uh, here, uh, the equation is surprisingly similar, even, even in, the, in, in its own typos, and... and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, the employment in a workplace W, the employment in DC, is just going to be the sum across all the places that can send workers to DC of how many people live there times the fraction of those people that choose to come work here, right? And again, all the action, most of the action, is going to be in this commuting share, right? And this commuting share, the share of residents of Arlington that work in DC is going to be higher if wages in DC are higher, of course, but it's going to be uh, higher if wages of all the other locations that compete with DC for residents in Arlington are going to be lower, right? And uh, uh, so that's going to depend on the distribution of wages, of course, on the commuting costs from Arlington to DC. And it's also going to depend really on the whole transportation network of, of, uh, of uh, uh, which is available to, to, to commuters and all the local conditions. Because I'm living in Falls Church and I'm working here in DC, but if something changes in a university in New York, I may change, purely hypothetically, I may, <laughs> I may change 
job, and I go to New York, and that, at that point, it'll, my commuting pattern will also change, okay? So this, this linkage is really extend throughout the economies as well, right? And there's another stark feature, uh, which is uh, in parallel to the one of trading goods, uh, that, 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 that um, shows up for commuting flows, 1% uh, increase in distance is associated with 4.3, decline in commuting flows, okay? So that number is, that is way higher than the 1.3 I told you for, for, for goods, which is kind of you know, very sensible. It's, very, it's much more expensive to ship people than, is it, than it is to ship goods, right? And that's why they decline so fast. And the number I want you to keep in mind is that a 1% increase in wages typically translate in 3.5% more commute, okay? Uh, that's an estimate that we have in, in our paper. So, uh, and you know, this number changes a little bit if you allow for congestion, but, but that's, what I want you to keep in mind is that this is a very high number, okay? So small changes in wages uh, are, are implying large changes in, in commuting flows. Com commuting margin is very sensitive, all right? Uh, okay, so that's, uh, so that's the model. That's all I wanted to say. There's a question. How am I doing on time? 24. 24. Oh, plenty of time. Uh, question, yes. Uh, so, for example, the, uh, the, the, the top line there, the 1% increase in wages translates into about 3.5% yeah. more commuters. Is there, there's an assumption of an equilibrium there. What went through my mind was DC just passed a, a minimum wage bump up. Yeah. So this is allowing for the market, labor markets to clear, right? Uh, so this is uh, the elasticity of labor supply. Correct. So okay. it is not after the market clear, because after the market clear, this 1% increase in wage may no longer be 1%. Okay. okay? This is just saying the labor supply curve. If uh, okay. relative wages between DC and Arlington increase 1%, the relative commuting shares will change by 3.5. That's, that's the precise statement I'm going to make. More questions? Okay, so I'm gonna walk here in a non-threatening way to get my water. Uh, and uh, so, um, so, so at this point, uh, there's a, I, I, I'm gonna use the model to make a quantitative exercise. And I was looking for a, for a real case study and I found one. Uh, uh, I just found that there's a Great Lakes Basin uh, Railroad that has been discussed. And I said, well, that's a great idea. And then a moment after, I said, that's a very bad idea. And so I didn't do it. So uh, <laughs> it's OK. Uh, and, and the reason I didn't do it is because this is really a general purpose model. There's lots of things that are in discussion in that that are not in the model, like congestion along the Chicago area. It's there, but it's not here. So I didn't want you guys to walk away with an idea of uh, uh, land prices are going to increase by 3%, so we should do it. Uh, so well, I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to build a rail line between, um, between Madison, Wisconsin, and Chicago, Illinois. Okay? And uh, um, surprisingly, uh, th th there should be a red here. It's not there as well. And it was there, my computer. So, so I'll, I'll tell you what happens. So when I... So I, I said I'm going to build a rail. Really what I'm doing is I'm reducing bilateral transportation costs between any two counties on this line. Okay, so that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about congestion and rails and everything. Okay, the, the, the thing that is going into the model is I'm saying if you live in Chicago, if you are a producer in Chicago, it's going to be 30% less expensive to ship stuff here, 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 here. Okay, and if you live in Madison is going to be 30% less expensive to ship stuff along the line. So this is exactly what I'm doing. And then for brevity, while I talk, uh, I'm going to say things like along the line or along the rail. Okay? But this is not really exclusively about rail. I'm just reducing bilateral transportation costs for merchandise. Okay, that's what I'm doing in the model. Right? So, so what's going to happen if you reduce bilateral transportation costs? Well, the first thing that happens, remember, the, uh, if, if you are in a producer in Madison and bilateral transportation costs uh, uh, out towards some markets go down, your market share is going to go up. And so your sales, your overall sales are going uh, uh, to go up too, right? And so this is a map of uh, what's going to happen to total sales of producers located in any of these counties, 
Okay? So what's happening here is that Madison is going to increase their total sales 10%, uh, and producers along the line are also going to increase sales 10%. And the reason is transportation costs are going down, so that is increasing, reducing the CIF price of the goods, and so that's increasing the market share and increasing total sales. Okay? So that's what's going to happen uh, uh, for these guys. And then there's an interesting pattern here because uh, um, the counties that are right close to the line, they lose a lot, right? So what's happening is there's, there's a big bump in sales for producers that are located in the county that receives the reduction, right? And then there's a steep decline in sales in counties that are exactly close to it, okay? And why is that happening? Well, because these counties, these producers' counties, didn't receive any benefit in terms of reduction in transportation, but now they face a tougher competition exactly in these markets. And remember, because of gravity in trade, these markets are very important for these counties. So these counties are the ones that are bound to lose more uh, uh, in, in, that, in that sense, exactly because, exactly because these markets now become tougher, they become more competitive, and, and, and these ones, and these, these producers relied a lot on it. And then the, the negative effect fades away as you move away from this line exactly, and this is a very small number, this is 0.1%, here there's nothing, uh, uh, because, because those markets were not as important. There was a couple of questions. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Dan Gross from Harvard Business School. So, question that I actually had earlier, but it comes more, a little more uh -huh. salient now, are total expenditures held fixed at this point? Are you basically saying the total mm. market is fixed? No, no, no. And we're shifting shares This is, uh, this is a good, thanks, thanks for reminding me. So, what you see is the change in final sales after all what needs to adjust is adjusted. So this is the, the, the long run change. Here, every people that wanted to move has moved. Every people that wanted to change job has changed job. Okay? Any firm that wanted to shut down has shut down. So this is comparing two steady states. Before the line and after the rail, the line uh, allowing for expenditures to change, for revenues to change, allowing for anything to change. It, just in the equation you had earlier, it's not only the shares that are, that are changing, but also the expenditures. Everything is changing. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It's the full general equilibrium change. Yes, two questions. Yes. Uh, Lou Ann Ren of Union Pacific. Is this assuming that the consumers of the transportation are bearing 100% of the costs? Uh, How does the model take into account if you have third parties, governments, either states or the federal government, bearing? some of the cost of the transportation? Uh, uh, nobody, so the, the, the cost of the improvement, you mean, or the cost of the transportation itself? Uh, the cost of the improvement. Yeah, right, so the, this is a, a gross measure in the sense that I am saying I am reducing transportation frictions. So this is how much is gonna, uh, everything is gonna change if you put that bilateral reduction in transportation costs, but, but that is not, taking into account who's paying for the change in transportation costs. I'll have a slide about who should be willing to pay. Uh, that, that you should, well, <laughs> we'll see later. I, I, yes. find, I find the result for the peripheral counties counterintuitive uh, uh, for the for, following reason. For these ones? The ones that lose so much business. Oh, these ones, yeah, yeah okay. Chicago is a big market. Yeah. It buys a lot of stuff. Yeah. Madison doesn't account for much of that. Right. It seems like those guys should have lower transportation costs by 2% or 5% mm -hmm. rather than 10%, why do they lose so much? Is that because, an assumption or is that a fine? No, no, because what happens is gravity, so, so in the, let me tell you in the model and then let me tell you why this is relevant empirically. So in the model, these counties trade a lot with these counties. So they may be small, but maybe they have 30, 40% of their sales that are to consumers here. And now consumers here have way better choices because stuff that is being produced along the line is cheaper. So this market became tougher for these producers and they're selling less, okay? And why this is relevant? Because we know that gravity in trade flows is a very stark feature of the data. So these guys are selling much more here than they're selling here, okay? More questions? Most of the questions are coming from this table. So this is, depending on your perspective, the smartest table. <laughs> <laughs> so how am I doing in time? Uh, 15? Okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, all right, so, so this is changes in total sales, but you really you can ask how are bilateral sales changing, right? How are changes, uh, how are sales from Chicago changing, for example? And uh, so this is a map for changes in sales that originate from Chicago, Illinois. And uh, uh, why are sales in Chicago going down? Well, because these are Chicago producers that are selling in Chicago, and now suddenly uh, Chicago consumers have access to cheaper stuff that is coming from outside. Right? So Chicago producers will lose market share in Chicago because their transportation cost within Chicago hasn't changed, but these other guys are stronger. So they will lose here, but for the same reason, they will gain along the line. Okay? And, uh, uh, and, and, they, and, and, and they will sell less around here because they are reorienting their sales. They, they will sell a little more to markets that now make more sense. Okay? Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that there's some green here even, and some white, even in, in places that are not receiving directly a transportation cost reduction, right? So this is a little strange in the sense that Chicago didn't benefit immediately. So what's happening here is that really the income of people that live here is going up, okay? And so uh, guys here now buy more from Chicago than they used to anyway, okay? And this is the first hint to general equilibrium effects, and I will, I will get to that uh, uh, later. Uh, in, in a couple of maps. So this is what happens for Chicago, this is what happens for Madison, same story. Really this is basically a, uh, so this is, I, I believe this is a quantity of interest, of quantity of policy interest in the sense that this is saying how much trade flows are changing along the line as a consequence of the change in the network, right? After we take uh, all the general equilibrium into account, right? So, uh, so what happens then to the whole economy, like to the local economy, to the overall economy. Well, what do we say? We said when there's a change in labor demand, labor supply will respond, and then whether it will respond more on wages or more on employment really depends on the elasticity of commuting. Mostly depends on the elasticity of commuting. Right? And we said that elasticity is very high. So we should expect some small and narrow changes when we look at nominal wages of workers, right? But we should expect broader changes when we look at employment. Right? So let me show you a map of the changes in nominal wages. That's what's happening. Nominal wages are going up along the line, and the reason is uh, 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 now labor is more valuable here. Right? So there's an increase in labor demand, and so wages respond a little bit. Wages fall a little bit here for people that work here. And why is that? Well, that's because labor now is less valuable here. Remember, these producers are losing market share in their most important markets. Right? And then really nothing happens around. Right? Just very, very tiny changes. However, if you look at the changes in employment, the map is much bigger. Right? And uh, what happens is employment is increasing in, in along, along the line exactly because now these producers are selling, uh, producing are selling more, uh, and employment is falling the most exactly around. Right? It's falling the most exactly around because those producers now are getting the hit. Right? So they, they are shutting down, so they release workers. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that um, Nobody is permanently losing her job here, right? Because this is a long-run equilibrium model, so people that are losing the job here will find more opportunity than they used to here, and by the way, at a higher wage, right? So what, what, what you see here as changes in employment is not a welfare statement yet, okay? I'm gonna talk about welfare in a second, in, in a few slides when I talk about real income, right? And, and the pattern that you, see, you saw before for sales kind of mimics the, the one for employment. There's big increases here, Big decreases here, and then the negative effect fades away as you move away. There were questions? No? Okay. Um, okay, so that's changes in total employment, but employment in a place can change uh, because more people commute there or because more people migrate and live there, right? So let me show you changes in total residence. So this is a map of changes in total residence. Uh, of course, total residence increase in the area because now. Um, this increase in labor demand generated the need for more people, so some choose to move there. What's interesting is that around the, the area here, uh, you don't see the decline, right? You saw a decline in employment, but people still move in, right? And the reason is commuting gives you the opportunity to live close to where you live, to, to where you work, but not quite there, right? So you may, you, you may not like living in Chicago, but you like the money. And so you are there, and you can, you, you can live close by and commute, okay? And that is still fine. That is still uh, a, a reasonable way to, to gain from the, from the increases in wages, right? And where are these people coming from? Where they're coming from around. And that's why you see these 0.1 changes around, uh, around the economy. I'm going to be early. 
Uh, okay, so, so that's changes in residence. Uh, so now we want to know uh, uh, about income, okay, about real income. And real income is nominal income of residents divided by the price index, right? And the price index is how much the price of consumption goods changes and how much the price of land, the price of houses change, right? That's what consumers consume in this world. So let me show you a map of the changes in the goods price index, and uh, this is a reasonable thing. Uh, bilateral shipments from Madison to Chicago, anywhere along the line, became cheaper, and so the CIF price of the goods became lower, so the price index for the goods must become smaller. And that's why you see the red thing along the line. And by the way, this county here is the one that benefits the most, exactly because this county here is the one that has, this is county's consumers are the one that get the best access now to the firms on both sides. Okay, and, uh, and the price index increases a little bit here for the reason I told you before. The firms are reorienting their sales, so these guys get a little less variety than they used to. Okay, uh, there's a question there. Yes. As, exactly, exactly right. So this is. So, so. Oh, yes, sure. Sorry, I'm just saying, so there are no, right. there are no network externalities built into there this are, base? Uh, so there are no network externalities in the sense that whatever network externality you think is going on will be reflected in the engineering estimates that you tell me about the reduction in transportation costs. Okay. So if you tell me transportation costs are going to go down 30% here and 10% okay. there because of congestion, okay. I feed those in and they are incorporated. That's not showing up here, though. No, because what I assume right. is that there's a constant 30%. Fair. Yep. Right? Okay, fair enough. Right? And uh, by the way, let me, let me say another thing. Uh, it, uh, it's obvious that if I uh, put a line here, then these places are also closer to Chicago, right? And that's not there either, right? So I'm just saying, somebody told me, someone in the room presumably, uh, that if I put a line somewhere here maybe, these counties will get all closer, okay? So that's what I'm simulating, right? But you tell me a change and I'll tell you the outcomes, okay? More, more questions? No. Um, okay, so uh, price index go down here, they go up here, they don't change pretty much uh, around. Uh, uh, so what happens to land values? So housing prices increase either because you have more people or because those more people are richer, right? They have more income. So this is a map of the changes in land value uh, as a consequence of, uh, of, of this new line. Okay, and uh, uh, of course land values increase here. Why is that? Well, because more people want to live here, and by the way, they make more money, right? More uh, uh, land value also increases here, either because more people live here, remember some people moved close, but not there, or because even if people didn't move close, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the population didn't change, they make more money, like this county. This county didn't gain population, they still, land value still goes up, that means uh, they're still making higher nominal wages, right? And of course, people will come away from other places. This is a, a world in which population doesn't grow, and so they will come away from, from here. And so you see small, with 0.1, 0.2% decline in land values because now people want to move here. Okay? So a couple of things about this. Um, so here, increases in land values are always only bad news for people. Okay? And the reason is here, housing is a consumption. Uh, uh, item, but it is not a store of wealth in this model, right? If you want to have a store of wealth, uh, uh, then things will look prettier in a sense because consumers will gain from, from whatever I told you, plus the fact that they now have houses that are worth more, okay? But if you want to do that, you need to keep track of who was living where before the change and where did he go, and that's a, a kind of a tricky thing to do. I'm doing it, but it's not in this paper. It's not in what you're seeing here today. Anyway, that's the first comment. The second comment is that uh, this is, in a sense, saying which uh, municipalities earn more in terms of uh, real estate taxes, right? And so this is, in some sense, a measure of willingness to pay of different, of different municipalities for this improvement, because this is saying who's going to gain and who's going to lose, right? Uh, so, OK, so that's the. Price index, so the price for goods went down, the price for houses went up. What's happening to the overall price index depends on the correlation between the two, 
whether they move together or not, and how now much housing matters for people. Okay? And so this is the change in the overall price index, and these are kind of small numbers with respect to what you saw before, because the things are moving in opposite directions. The housing prices are going up, but consumer prices are going down. Right? So you see moderate increases overall in the consumer price index. Uh, some decrease exactly here, because this guy was, uh, this guy was the one that benefited the most from, from the bilateral reduction. Uh, and so, so then the question becomes, what's happening to real income? Right? Uh, real income is the change in nominal income divided by the change in, uh, in the price index. And what's happening basically in the end is that this, uh, uh, everybody along the line is gaining in real terms. Okay? They can buy more stuff uh, uh, in, uh, uh, than they used to. And, uh, and, the, and the positive effects spread out in the, in the area because, uh, because of, of the spatial linkages that I've emphasized uh, throughout the talk. Okay? So that's pretty much what I had to say. Uh, and uh, so let me, just, let me just conclude by reminding you what I, what I showed you. I argue that the transportation network creates spatial linkages among locations and that these spatial linkages are uh, important, both on the good side and on the worker sides. So if you want to evaluate changes in the network, uh, it seems like a reasonable idea to incorporate these things in a general equilibrium model. Okay? And such a model can be built, and I showed you how to interpret some of these, uh, 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 some of these uh, outcomes. Current research is improving on many of the dimensions uh, you may find uh, unpalatable here, uh, but this is overall something that, uh, uh, that can be done. And uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dip Miller with the Surface Transportation Board, so I want to be sure I understand this. As I was watching your presentation, I'm thinking, this is just redistributing people and wages and uh, dollars. But at the end, you said a change in real income. Yes. So overall, do you see real income going up as a consequence of the transportation investment? Yes. So let me, let me qualify my answer. The answer is yes, uh, and in the, in the measures you saw before. Okay. So changes in real income are much smaller than changes in nominal wages because the price index is going up. Uh, so that is the first piece of the answer. The second piece of the answer goes back to a question I got before, which is who's paying for the transportation infrastructure? I'm not incorporating that, right? So if, for example, these guys were paying, then I don't know. Okay? It may be that after they pay with their tax money, uh, the, the gain is smaller. Okay? But, but to, to make that statement, I would have to know how much does it cost to introduce that 30% I'm simulating. And that piece I don't have a model for. Okay, so I guess... Um... You know, for people who have advocated for spending on transportation, what mm -hmm. they would really like to be able to say, and I'm wondering if your model allows for that, is that if you make a worthy investment in transportation, let's say with federal dollars, so it's from all the taxpayers, overall the country is better off as a consequence, not just that you're moving people around from one region to so another. This is not, okay, so this is not just relocation, and the reason is not just relocation, you see it in the green here. If it only was relocation, this would all be white, right? Nobody would gain, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that would be the end of the story, right? Uh, whether or not you want to spend tax dollars on a worth investment, those are two statements on which my model cannot take a position. The first, uh, because uh, uh, the way it is financed, that is to say, whether it's with taxes or with debt, whether everybody's paying or just somebody, uh, all those questions are sort of political economy questions that I have nothing to say about here, right? And um, uh, so that's... Uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much. So, so I, oh, the second question is, what is a worth investment, right? Uh, uh, you, you, need to, you need to tell me how much does it cost to introduce that 30% reduction, right? So if you tell me that, that's going to be a cost. This is going to be a gross gain, right? And then you subtract these two things, you know, accounting for who's paying, and then I'll tell you whether this is a gain for anybody or for somebody and a loss for somebody else. So is it fair to say this, what your model tells us is if you can reduce transportation cost, you can increase real income? Yes, and then the question becomes, what is the price of that increase in real income, right? If I make these people pay, these people are not going to be happy, right? But if I make these people pay, maybe yes.
Um, but to follow up on that, Rondo. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, but, but as I look at the map, mm -hmm. at a gross level, everybody gains. There are no losers. Is that right? That's right. And that strikes me as, if I look at international trade theory, that sounds like an old result. That more trade helps everybody. But Krugman and people like that have showed yeah. us that more trade creates losers and winners. Right. So what is this missing that, that we don't see any losers, even at the gross level? So um, <laughs> how can I answer this question in minus zero seconds? <laughs> can I? OK. Um, so um, let me make a, a, sh a narrow statement related to this and then a broader statement that we can keep talking about later. Um, this model, for example, doesn't have um, differences in skills, right? Here, everybody's the same in terms of skills. There's no high educated people, low educated people, right? One of the debates in trade is whether low-skilled workers lose from trade while high-skilled workers gain, right? So if I introduce the low-skilled, high-skilled dimension, I will get distributional impacts across people within locations, right? In addition to distributional outcomes, across locations, right? Then if I make that distinction, uh, the, the picture is gonna look more nuanced, right? So I, I, the reason you don't see any losers, well, the technical reason you don't see any losers is that in, that in that dimension is because there is no such dimension here, right? But I can introduce it. Now, in terms of a broader statement, uh, I, I am still not sure uh, that, that if you use a reasonably quantified model, uh, there are uh, uh, significant losers. Uh, from trade, but this is not a question for this talk, and uh, I'm very happy to talk about uh, it to you later. Okay? Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is Kevin Neal's the Brattle Group. I, I haven't heard you saying much about inter industry linkages here. Right, because there are no industries. There is one sector. So now, in, one, uh, in, in the extension I'm working on, uh, I have input output linkages. That is, I'm, I'm allowing people not to eat coal but to use coal in, uh, in, in production, right? And I'm allowing for different people, for different industries to use, uh, to use, to use coal at different intensities, for example, well, that, right? That, so it, that can be, that I, can I be done I would think sure. that would give you very different answers. If you that would give me more, well, I don't know if it's very different in terms of real income, uh, but, but I know that, uh, for example, one thing that I know for sure is that the consequences will not be concentrated around this area because now changes in labor demand here in some industries will imply changes in the products that those industries use, and those products may be done elsewhere. So you may see changes here, but also changes in LA or changes in, in New York. The other issue that I think could have a big effect on just the overall pattern of the results would be um, scale effects or you know, scale economies, minimum of efficient scales of production. Like, right. for example, it doesn't make sense to produce a couple of dozen cars in every county. For in the firms, country. yeah, I agree. So for firms, this model, this I didn't mention because I didn't have time, but for firms, they have fixed cost increase in returns to scale. So the, those things are there. Then the question becomes, if you have different industries like cars and meat, whether fixed cost matters more for cars and meat. And then at that point, uh, I, I, I agree with you. But this is coming back to a generalization of the model get discontinuous shifts in equilibrium. For example, at, one, at some level of cost, it might be optimal to locate a production near the site of inputs, and then suddenly it could discontinuously shift where it's optimal to put it near the site of consumption. Um, if it changes, the, if the location changes, yes. If it is discontinuously changing, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think so. Uh, because of the mathematical structure of the model, uh, uh, th I mean, those discontinuities occur when you have multiple equilibria, and I don't want to get into too much of a technical discussion. We can talk about it later. Those type of discontinuities happen when you have multiple equilibria, and here we prove that there's a unique equilibrium. So it's, things will change smoothly. They will change along your direction, but they will change smoothly. Um, hi, this is Namita Patia from yes. U.S. Government Accountability Office. Sure. Um, so does, do you take into account, you know, does your model take into account what happens to um, other costs, you know, the re alternatives, and whether it's just this reduction in 30% reduction in one particular mode of transportation, but then, you know, if it changes. Right, so, so, this is, uh, so in this model, there are two transportation uh, aspects. One is sh shipment of people, so commuting, and the other one is transportation of merchandise. How that transportation of merchandise occurs 
uh, uh, rail versus truck versus boat. I'm not talking about it later. I'm just simulating the consequences of reduction in transportation costs. It could be introduced, but, but it's not there. So on that, I have nothing to say about it. And then um, one more related question. Um, so is, is your mo model additive, or it cannot be, for, for example, if there's a 30% reduction in costs in a lot of different locations. So that uh -huh. some of this, you know, the benefits get offset by... I know. wouldn't say they get offset, but I would say they interact. It's, that is to say, I'm not sure whether the gains in one location are greater because you introduce changes in another location. It, it's, it's very plausible, but I cannot tell. I, I, just, I would just need to run the model. All right. thank, thank, you. thank you very much.